This is Chthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello, and welcome to Chthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke, and this week we have a, a rather a subject that's been rather daunting for me for a long time because it's uh, because the subject itself is so huge. Um, I've been I've been I've uh, had requests to do this particular feminine figure for quite a long time, and I have. I've put it off for a long time simply because there's so many, there's so many components and there's no way I'm going to cover them all in this podcast, but I will, I will make my best effort. Um, the subject of today's podcast is Babylon. Okay. Now Babylon, who is Babylon? Um, well, there's probably multiple connected answers to that question. Uh, now, if you uh, if you are not familiar with uh, the philosophy slash religion of Philema, uh, then to you Babylon would be a biblical figure. Uh, Babylon having to do with the whore of Babylon, mentioned in the book of Revelation in the Bible. And Babylon is uh, it has this reputation as the, sort of the the holy whore. And as we've talked about in the past, when we talk about the, the archetypes of the feminine or the way in which the feminine is perceived or broken up for, you know, in what I'm going to call archetypal thinking and what ends up being projected into the roles that women are assumed to play, you have the, this, this axis of virgin and whore. Um, we've talked before about how uh, virginity is one of those things and chastity Tend, and obedience tend to be these things that are honored in a more uh, Christian culture, things that are embodied perhaps in the figure of the Virgin Mary. Um, but as we know, the older goddesses um, and, and the, the women who are the darker goddesses who are associated with the fringe, who may be associated with the disenfranchised, um, may be associated with those who have difficulty meeting basic needs and so forth. These tend to be goddesses who can be very, um, they're, they're very powerful, but they're also very, very sexual. Uh, they tend to be associated with red and the color red. And uh, there's this idea of, of seduction or lust or sex that is not obviously in the, what's considered to be the um, traditional marital con, uh, context that you see in the Western monotheistic religions. And perhaps in others, too, if you're talking about respectable Orthodox religion in just about any culture. Now, Babylon is is a very, um, <laughs> she's, there's more to Babylon than the biblical version, okay? And probably a lot of people listening to this podcast are also Thelemites, so of course you are very, very well aware of the the breadth and the depth of the iconography of Babylon, spelled B-A-B. L-O-N, rather than the place Babylon that has a Y in it. Um, it you know, you're gonna, there's, that there's, a, there's a whole esoteric meaning behind Babylon. And in fact, she is one of the figures of what you might call the pantheon of, of Thelemic, uh, I hesitate to say deities, they're, they're figures. They're, uh, they're, they're figures of great, uh, of great power. Um, so let me, let me get started here. Um, you know, the Babylon, we, we, what we end up wanting to talk about is, um, we, we certainly want to talk about the origins of the term Babylon. Um, but she is not, um, this is a, if I'm, if you're looking at the YouTube version of this, I have a uh, William Blake's version of Babylon uh, showing, um, it's, you know, she, she tends, she has, there, there's this, this image of her, of course, in Western culture as being something that represents an evil, that represents lust, represents the kinds of things that we had associated with Lilith, for example. Um, there is a disobedience, there's a drunkenness, there is a lust for life. Um, but if you also remember what we've said about Tantra, the whole point of Tantra um, as a religion, even if, you know, certainly there's a sexual component, and Babylon certainly embraces all of those uh, sexual components. Um, but Tantra is about 
being spiritual and still living in the world. So in a sense, there, you, as we are going to see, there is something of a tantric element to Babylon in the way that she functions. Only again, just as we had said at, um, I'd said at one point when I talk about the biblical creation myth as talking about nature as corrupt, and that that view of, um, that, that mythical view of, of the world, that narrative makes us think of ourselves as corrupt, ourselves as broken, ourselves as imperfect, and the world around us is somehow a mistake and a sin. Um, thus, um, Babylon, who becomes sort of an embodiment of nature, in a way, at least in one version, she is a, a, a kind of an earth mother, um, that makes everything that she represents an abomination. Okay, so and and it and never is it no ne nowhere is it stated more clearly that this is has been the the Western religious view than what we see in Revelation. Um, I actually want to talk in this episode about three different Babylons. Um, first, we're going to go back to the origins of the biblical horror of Babylon. Uh, then we also want to talk about uh, Babylon as she appears esoterically, probably. Possibly, I should say, for the first time um, in the works of uh, Edward Kelly and John Dee in their um, receipt of the uh, Enochian system and the, and the calls of the Aethers, which we will talk about. If that's not something you're familiar with, I will explain what that is. Um, and the first time place that we see Babylon or Babylon um, mentioned in these um, angelic transmissions that Dee uh, supposedly received through Edward Kelly. Um, and finally, and, and most significantly, is the Thelema's Babylon, okay, which is um, the this, this essence of uh, the the supernal triad in the Kabbalah. She she is she represents uh, Bina, um, and she is the she is drunk on the blood of the saints, and that has a much um, more it has a meaning much different than might appear uh, at first glance if you are looking at this as somebody who is not familiar with Thelema. Okay, um, so, and, and among the uh, uh, Thelemic Babylon, we want to include uh, her different appearances, her appearance in uh, Crowley's Enochian workings in The Vision and the Voice, her appearance in the uh, Thoth Tarot deck as the Lust card, and also her appearance, um, we'll talk about uh, Jack Parsons and Marjorie Cameron's uh, Babylon working, which is, um, I don't, I don't know... <laughs> I don't know that it's it's entirely officially part of the Lemic um, accepted texts or lores. It's certainly not part of the Gnostic Mass. Babylon is mentioned in the Gnostic Mass, um, but nonetheless, it's 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 an interesting um, way in which Babylon uh, may have may have expressed herself, or um, may re maybe represent more about Jack Parsons and and what happened to him as a. Uh, as somebody who was practicing as a magician, um, you know, when, when he when he actually calls upon Babylon. Because Babylon, like a lot of our goddesses that we see in Tantra, as much as she represents liberation, she also represents destruction. Okay. And and to encounter Babylon is to uh, is to face destruction, is to face a, a kind of death. Um, because it basically crushes out and presses like a like a wine like presses you like a grape and gets rid of all of these um you know, and gets rid of all of the things that you identify with or that you think you were, which uh, is very much, uh, it's, it, a lot of it has to do with the taking the oath of the abyss and, and this idea of crossing the abyss. Um, but again, we'll, we'll get into that. That may be, this may be very esoteric for people who are not familiar. And I'm trying to gear this podcast not only towards those who have a knowledge of this, but also people who are, um, you know, who are not familiar with this at all and would like to learn something. So with that, let's begin. Um, I, oh, I did want to mention a couple of sources, too, before I go ahead. Um, a couple of really good sources if you want to delve more into, if you want to delve more into the esoteric Babylon, I would recommend Peter Gray's book, uh, The Red Goddess, which was put out in 2008 by Scarlet Imprint. Not sure if there are impressions, if they're still printing it, or if, if you have to go and get secondhand copies at this point, but... Um, but very a very thorough and interesting work by by another magician um, on uh, on Babylon as a, as a figure. 
And also I'm going to, the more recently published um, Eloquent Blood by uh, Manon Hedenberg White. Uh, she, that book came out in 2019. I remember she gave a talk at, um, I was moderating a talk at um, the AAR conference in San Diego, and she came and uh, gave a talk on, um, <coughs> excuse me, on Babylon as a scarlet woman. Okay. And because <coughs> that is another one of her monikers is the scarlet woman, the woman in red, right? Um, but this was also uh, relevant to Crowley's definition of scarlet woman and the idea of the office of scarlet woman. And she talks specifically about Leah Herseg, who was um, one of Crowley's you know, last scarlet women um, that he had worked with. So, uh, and, and we'll talk about, about that term and what that means also. Um, now, I have not yet read Manon's book. I haven't, um, I haven't read it, but it's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely thoroughly researched and will definitely, you know, help, help bring in to focus that, that idea, that, that role of Babylon, um, or role of Scarlet Woman, uh, as we see, uh, in, in Western esoteric tradition. So another two books that I'm recommending, because again, this podcast is only going to cover so much, but if it's a topic that interests you, and there are many other collections, there are essays, um, all you have to do is, is do a search. There's a lot of academic essays on, um, on Babylon and Babylon's role um, in, in the esoteric feminine. So, okay. So let's move on to the biblical Babylon. All right, so we all, um, well, maybe not all of us, but let's just say I, I tend to make the assumption that most people are familiar with the idea of the whore, the great beast and the whore of Babylon. Because even if you have uh, whatever version of Christianity somebody might be familiar with, okay, um, uh, Christianity, obviously there are many different varieties of Christianity. There's um, the, the Catholic version that many people are aware of there is the um, and then of course there's thought of different Protestant varieties of uh, of Christianity uh, some very evangelical and some where you get into these sort of more uh, millenarian cults uh, that that you know that, that are focused on the idea of the apocalypse the idea of the end of the world and their focus is um, uh, John's book of Revelation uh, John of Patmos now. Revelation was, of course, written, it was written in a specific time period to address a specific um, political and social context, namely that of the Roman Empire uh, at the time of, of Nero in particular, and at the time of the destruction of the Second Jewish Temple. Because you remember Christianity then was largely a, uh, a, a Jewish, um, it was a Jewish sect, basically, and there was a lot of arguments. I mean, well, first of all, there was a lot of different versions of what Christianity meant, but there was also a lot of different versions of, um, you know, there, there was an argument between letting um, whether or not Gentiles should be allowed into the into the religion. And of course, when Paul has his great conversion, um, of course, he starts uh, admitting, you know, it's no longer a Jewish sect. It's it's for everybody, and uh, Gentiles are. Um, uh, admitted to the religion, something, by the way, John of Potmos does not like because he is a good Nazarene. And this revelation that he puts down is when he is in exile and he, you know, he supposedly has this, these, these great visions, which we're not going to obviously get into all of them or the whole story of revelation. It is worth noting that this revelation is one among probably 20 others that were written. Uh, but this was the one that was chosen for the canon because this is the one that is the, the most punitive and that that sort of works out for um, you know the uh, this that that works out for when you are trying to take a religion and make it the religion of empire. So therefore, uh, there's there's a there's a heavy judgment associated with it, and obviously it is better for the ruling powers that there is a sense of you know follow this follow follow the rules here or else. You know there's there's this definitely a benefit to making this a, a religion about, um, you know, about reward and punishment and what will happen to you if you, if you, if you don't obey the rules. You know, there's not the idea of the other revelations where, yes, things are going to be a mess, but eventually Christ will come and claim everybody and everybody will be saved and it'll be just awesome. Um, that's not, that's not what this one says at all. Um, although this book is one that, that says a lot of things that people don't really understand. Um, 
It was the the somewhat I don't know if it's ironic or not, but it, it, it one but somebody had noted that if anybody's going to have an accurate vision of what the afterlife is like in Christianity, and if they're going to base uh, the coming world on these ideas that are put forward in Revelation uh, and, bib- and biblically accurate views, by the way, um, then then actually the Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones who have it right. <laughs> so if you read their view and you read their view and it sounds absurd, and then you realize, but but to their credit, that is they, they're city stating exactly what the Bible says. But I don't want to get too sidetracked into that. That's something you know worth researching if if that is a topic that interests you. So, um, okay, so let's talk about Babylon. So where does she come in? He has these visions, okay? And, you know, he has all these angelic visions. He has visions of hell. He has visions of, you know, demons and, you know, battles and the last day and all this kind of stuff. And at one point, he talks about this, the, this great beast that appears with many heads, okay? And riding the great beast um, is the harlot or the whore, Um And here I'll read it to you from Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in uh, in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and on the blood of the martyrs of Jesus." So Revelation goes on to talk about um, how Babylon uh, ends up falling. Okay, the idea that, um, you know, uh, in uh, uh, 1715, he says, he talks to the um, angel, and the angel says, the waters that you saw where the harlot is seated and peoples and multitudes uh, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns you saw, they and the beast will will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, being of one mind, giving over their royal power to the beast, and the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman you saw is the great is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, so she is in this view, view she is really literally a representation of the city of Babylon. Now, if you recall anything about the Old Testament, uh, the ancient Jews were certainly in in, in contention a lot of the time for their own territory, for their own kingdom of Judah. And, you know, the, the empires connected to Babylon were, were certainly one of the, the struggling points or sticking points for them. So we do see, um, you know, you still see this connection to this idea of Babylon as the one who is opposing who opposing the worship of Yahweh, the ones who destroy the temples of the Jews, you know, and, and this is carrying over into this vision that eventually becomes a Christian one about this idea of, um, you know, Babylon is representing a kind of an opposing city or a city that represents all of the quote unquote foreign values that, um, and you see this in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, this, this definite um, idea of we are, we are not going to take on the ways of, uh, of our foreign neighbors. Um, which, which is quite curious, especially when we think about, um, you know, exhortations in the Bible to welcome the foreigner, just as you yourself were foreigners in the land of Egypt. You know, there's a lot having to do with otherness, uh, you know, the, the Jewish idea of being, um, always feeling like they're, they're nomadic or being an other, like wherever they are, there's somebody's always challenging them for the, for the land and the kingdom that they have. And uh, this idea of their covenant with Yahweh as an attempt to, um, you know, as the God who's supposed to protect them and give them, you know, give them their promised land, their place to, to settle. And, of course, a lot of this falls into uh, the politics of the modern state of Israel, too. Um, but in any case, it's, we see this idea of Babylon as representing, she represents the earth, she represents uh, sensuality of the earth, 
uh, you know, drunkenness, which is funny because this almost seems to be a, um, a poke at Dionysus, who is probably the model for Jesus, or at least uh, the archetypal model for Jesus. Um, and, you know, and, and so there, and of course, Babylon is a whore. She's, she's feminine. She represents uh, sexuality that is untamed and unbridled, uh, unbridled. You know, it's it's the this idea of, of pure sensuality. So, and, and of course, this is portrayed as an evil that needs to fall and, you know, be, um, be taken. You know, she needs to be stripped naked and humiliated, right? This is the, this is the idea. And here we, we can almost see the embodiment in Western culture of its attitude to the, what you might want to call the dark feminine. Uh, you know, right there, pretty, pretty much well summarized in, in that particular section. Um, now, in addition to the biblical Babylon, okay, we, you know, this is an idea that has been around for a long time. But one of the things I would like to talk about is the, uh, is the Enochian Babylon, okay. Um, now, just, uh, just reading this, I've just, I've picked up the Wikipedia entry on Babylon, mainly because um, whoever wrote it, obviously, is somebody who who knows something about what they're talking about? Not all Wikipedia entries are reliable, but this one's pretty good. Um, under Enochian magic, they say, um, the source for Babylon is from the system of Enochian magic created by John, uh, Dr. John Dee and Sir Edward Kelly in the 16th century. The system is based on a unique language called Enochian, uh, two words of which are certainly relevant. The first is Babylon, with a D, which is translated as harlot. The other is Babylon, which means wicked. Some flavor of context in which they appear can be found in a communication received by D and Kelly in 1587. And they, uh, they cite this um, here, but I'm gonna read it to you from Peter Gray's book, because I have a copy of it here. Um, I should also mention um, when they received the, the Enochian, which is Enochian, which is a language and it's also a system, uh, there's a numbering system associated with there's there's the aethers and then there's the elementals in Enochian and there are 30 aethers in Enochian magic uh, which are associated with spirits of the air sort of angelic spirits and then there's a whole <laughs> a whole mess of tables that deals with uh, elemental beings beings of the earth uh, which one you know you, you'd have to um, put together these the, these squares of these numerical squares to figure out what names you're looking at and, and whom you're whom you're calling, uh, if you are going to do what you would think of as elemental magic. And what's interesting is is the way in which, uh, very similarly, just as we have we have split, um, you know, the idea of the spiritual and the material. Um, similarly, you know, the spirits of the aethers are considered to be one type of spirit, whereas the earth is um, that, that there's more of a more of a demonic flavor to the spirits of earth. You know, they're about acquiring stuff and doing things, whereas the others have to do more with, you know, attaining spiritual knowledge. And it's funny how systems of magic have picked up that, um, you know, pick, systems of theurgy, theurgy that have picked up that split um, in addition to, um, you know, the, they've picked it up, you know, in other words, they, they're, they're magical systems, but they're, they're very, monotheistic in their inflection. I think that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, now, John Dee was the uh, astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I, and Edward Kelly was a man um, who he ended up working with. I, I don't want to get too far into the story of Dee and Kelly, as it's available in many, many places. Um, but Kelly was a little bit of a, you know, uh, he, he's... He's a bit of a, a sinister character. I mean, it's, it's whether or not he was um, totally legit is, is hard for anybody to say. However, the Enochian system that he ended up writing down was so complicated, so massively complicated, that if he was making all this up as a joke, I mean, you know, it, it's it's not, not very likely. And people, I mean, Dee and Kelly never seemed to do much with the Enochian system, but other magicians since then have made use of it. Um, my own work with it has been, um, you know, mainly with the etheric Etheric calls the same kind of thing that Crowley does in the vision and the voice. Um, and I have my own notes on my own workings, which usually last for about 30 days. Um, but the, and the elemental ones, I'm not going to lie to you. The reason I don't do any of the elemental ones, other than that I don't tend to appeal to spirits to get stuff, because that just, I just, I don't know, I just don't need to. Um, 
is also the fact that numeric. I'm not a math wizard, so honestly, um, literally or figuratively, I, I, I've just said if I had to sit there and, and work out the, the formulas to figure out, you know, who I'm calling on for what, I will inevitably screw it up royally. So I just kind of like, yeah, you know what? This is more for people who are more mathematically minded. So I tend to prefer um, other kinds of magic if I'm going to if I'm going to practice at all. Um, but interestingly, but but this system that was transmitted to um, to Dee and Kelly is uh, is quite extensive. And I'm just going to read this from Peter Gray's book. In the center of the table is a three by four square, which can be used as a key to decipher the inscription around the edge of the table. Now, this is something called the holy table, which you need to have um, as the basis um, with something called the sigillium dei ameth, which is uh, another kind of uh, sigil, that round sigil that you would, with angelic names that you would put, um, you, you put them as the footers underneath the holy table. And you also have a larger sigil that you place in the middle of the table on the same square that um, Gray is talking about. Um, now he says, uh, this is go back to Peter Gray. Gerald Schuler has somewhat controversially interpreted the text as reading, this is the place of the outpouring of forgotten treasure in the form of ecstasy. Only fire is substantial here. This is the way of Babylon and the beast, who is the first form. The eyes need only rest upon the name of any guardian and its representative will speedily be encountered. Okay. Um, so um, in this working, we do see, we do see Babylon mentioned here. Um, now this particular uh, communication that was received in 1587, I'm just trying to open to my page here because I have a, uh, here we go. I'm going to read the whole thing to you. I'm, you know, apologies if this comes across as a bit long, but uh, the whole thing is um, pretty important. And this is this is a uh, communication from uh, uh, from Babylon to D. N. Kelly. I am the daughter of fortitude and ravished every hour from my youth. For behold, I am understanding and science. I am understanding and science dwelleth in me, and the heavens oppress me. They co covet and desire me with infinite appetite. Few or none that are earthly have embraced me, for I am shadowed with the circle of the sun and covered with the morning clouds. My feet are swifter than the winds and my hands are sweeter than the morning dew. My garments are from the beginning and my dwelling place is in myself. The lion knoweth not where I walk, neither do the beasts of the field understand me. I am deflowered yet a virgin. I sanctify and am not sanctified. Happy is he that embraceth me. For in the night season I am sweet, in the day full of pleasure. My company is a harmony of many symbols, and my lips sweeter than health itself. I am a harlot, for such as ravish me, and a virgin, with such as know me not. For lo, I am loved of many, and I am a lover to many. And as many as come unto me as they should, do have their entertainment. Purge your streets, O ye sons of men, and wash your houses clean. Make yourselves holy and put on righteousness. Cast out your old strumpets and burn their clothes. Abstain from the company of other women that are defiled, that are sluttish and not so handsome and beautiful as I. And then I will come and dwell amongst you, and behold, I will bring forth children unto you, and they shall be the sons of comfort. I will open my garments and stand naked before you, that your love may be more inflamed toward me. As yet I walk in the clouds, as yet I am carried with the winds, and cannot descend unto you for the multitude of your abominations and the filthy loathsomeness of your dwelling places. Behold these four, who is he that shall say they have sinned? Or unto whom they shall make account, not unto you, O son, you sons of men, nor unto your children, for unto the Lord belongeth the judgment of his servants. Now therefore let the earth give forth her fruit unto you, and let the mountains forsake their barrenness, where your footsteps shall remain. Happy is he that saluteth you, and cursed is he that holdeth up his hands against you. And power shall be given unto you from henceforth to resist your enemies, and the Lord shall always hear you in times of troubles. And I am sent to play the harlot with you, and am to enrich you with the spoils of other men. Prepare for me, for I come shortly. Provide your chambers for me, that they may be sweet and cleanly, for I will make a dwelling place amongst you. 
I will be common with the Father and the Son, yea, and with all of them that truly favoreth you. For my youth is in her flower, and my strength is not to be extinguished with man. Strong am I above and below. Therefore provide for me, for below I now salute you, and let peace be amongst you, for I am the daughter of comfort. Disclose not my secrets unto women, neither let them understand how sweet I am, for all things belongeth not to every one. I come unto you again. Now that's interesting, um, the way that she uh, appears to them and appears in this, this, this kind of this somewhat seductive form and says, don't reveal me to women, uh, which is, you know, which is interesting. It makes, it makes Babylon into a kind of anima figure in a way. I mean, it, she's more than that. I don't want to, I don't want to reduce her to, um, you know, one term or one archetype, but that is one of the things of the anima. The anima is the one who allures, the one that may lure you away from your, uh, from your marital relationship, from your, um, you know, from, from what you've, what you may have committed yourself to. And, and I, and the idea of that as, you know, this, this idea of, of chaste relationship as being somehow, uh, or marriage as it has been conceived as somehow being an abomination. So, uh, so we have this, we have this idea of a Babylon that appears in the Enochian and, um, whether or not this is where it was, uh, the source of where it was picked up in later magical workings, uh, it's probably at least one place where that happened. Okay. So that brings us to Uncle Al, uh, Alistair Crowley. Uh, Cro um, Crowley has a, has this idea of, of Babylon that, that comes from, uh, his, his own prophetic writings, his, his own work with the, uh, Enochian ethers. In fact, um, it's his, it's his own work with the, uh, Enochian magic, particularly, um, let me just, uh, get my, get my, I think I want to say it was the 12th and the 9th aether. Um, yeah, he, in the, in the visions that he received when he performed those particular workings, uh, you know, this is the first time that we see Babylon mentioned in Thelema. And in Thelema, now, okay, let me, let me stop here for a moment and talk about what Thelema is. Thelema is a, you can call it a religion, I guess, but it's more of a, a magical philosophy or a magical way of working that is based on a lot of other systems. Like most, ni most 19th and 20th century occultism, it's all very heavily borrowed from other places and other systems. And this particular one, Thelema is probably, there, there's a lot of heavy borrowing from Buddhism and from Tantra. There's a lot of heavy borrowing from, um, you know, magical works of, you know, ma magical grimoires of people like uh, Agrippa or, or um, Eliphas Levy or, or these other. Um, and then, of course, yes, this, the Sanokian work of, of John Dee. There's, there's a lot of um, piecing together of Kabbalah. There's a piecing together of a lot of these different elements um, into this system of, of Thelema, which was uh, founded by Crowley. Probably its core text is something called the Book of the Law, which was revealed to Crowley's wife, Rose, in 1912. There was, uh, they had visited Egypt, and Rose was his wife. She was not, I will not say she was particularly a magician, but uh, she fell into a trance and Crowley, of course, first didn't, didn't really think anything of it. He just kind of smirked. He didn't really believe there was anything going on. But then, um, when he asked her, we went into uh, the museum in Cairo and he said, well, show me Horus. And she ended up pointing to this, uh, stele number 666, which is also referred to as the stele of revealing. And it shows, um, the priest, um, um, Ankanov Konsu, uh, you know, acting as scribe. And he was absolutely amazed at this. And that night, uh, Rose actually began to dictate what now we think of as Liber Legis or the Book of the Law. And there are three chapters, and they um, are focused on three different deities. Uh, Nuit, we talked about, I didn't really talk so much about the Thelemic Nuit in the last episode, but uh, but, but Nuit, um, or Nut is the is the first. And she is the uh, the speaker of chapter one. Ahadi is the speaker of chapter two, another deity. Um, and then Rahor Kuit, um, this other manifestation of Horus, uh, speaks in chapter three. And chapter three being, of course, uh, the most troublesome and disturbing because it is the most violent uh, in its expression. 
And this was considered to be something of a prophecy, but it also ended up becoming the impetus for Crowley um, creating a whole new ritual, namely one called the Gnostic Mass, which uh, embodies a lot of these, these solemnic elements. The priestess in the Mass tends to represent wheat. Uh, the priest uh, has this role, this, this sort of Hadith role, because it's, it's, it's it almost, there's very, something very Shiva Shakti about it. It's the idea of, um, and that is why it's called a sex magic ritual, even though there is no actual sex in the Gnostic Mass. The priest and the priestess, the way that they relate to each other, the, the, um, the incantations, the symbols, the, the acts, are meant to um, produce something that they call the 93 current. 93 being a um, Notarakon shorthand for both words love and will. And Philema focuses very heavily on will, on the idea of one doing one's authentic will. Okay. And by attending Mass and by receiving communion in Mass, you become, you, you partake in that current that is created um, by the priest and priestess, transmitted through the deacon to the congregation. And uh, when, you, when you take communion, you, uh, you know, this, this is something that is meant to create a new birth, that sort of, you know, Rahur Kuit element in yourself to enable you and embolden you to do what your will is. So... Um, that, that is the purpose of the Gnostic liturgy and people who try to turn it into a black mass or, you know, some other kind of, you know, satanic sexual thing. Sorry, it's not what it is. It's actually a very beautiful ritual. I, I always recommend that people, um, attend a Gnostic mass because it is extremely, uh, potent and extremely moving. So, so Babylon, Babylon does not really fit into the book of the law. She is mentioned as the scarlet woman. But she tends to be mentioned more as this is where I had the, had the idea of Scarlet Woman as an office. Okay. Uh, and that's the idea that Crowley himself is the great beast, because you remember he referred to himself. And that's where the term Tomegatherion comes in, uh, which is the uh, Greek for uh, the great beast. And he is, so Therion and Babylon figure into a lot of Thelemic ritual. For example, if you look at Liber Reguli or if you look at um, the Star Ruby, there, there's, there's mentions in these particular rituals where you, you invoke Babylon and you invoke Therion and you invoke, you may invoke uh, Nuit. You, you know, you invoke these different uh, Thelemic, I'm, I'm going to use the term deities just for lack of a better term, but these, these concepts, um, which are meant, which represent these kinds of forces. And, you know, so, so this is this is something that's very very uh, unique to Thelema, and so we need to talk about the different ways in which this manifests in Thelema. Um, now, what I there's the if anybody's familiar with the Crowley Thoth tarot deck, you're familiar with the image of um, the of Babylon riding the beast on the lust card, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these things. So, first, I want to talk about. Um, I've got, I've got a number of different sources in my hand here, so forgive me for messing around here for a minute, but, um, okay. So one of the first places we see Crowley talk about Babylon is in the, um, the cry of the 12th Aether in the vision and the voice. Okay. And let's see, and, and this is the Aether of Lo. Okay. And Lo is L-O-E is the, the governor of that particular aether. And it, uh, as he mentions in his footnote, Lo equals Cancer, Libra, and Virgo. And also uh, the, the Hebrew letters, um, Heth, Lamed, and Yod, and equals the number 48. And he says four plus eight equals 12, one and two, three, which is Bina. Now we're gonna talk about Bina in a second. These are all aspects of Babylon, okay? And, um, okay. So he talks about uh, the two stone, uh, two pillars of flame in the midst of a chariot of white fire. This seems to be the chariot of the seventh key of the tarot, but is drawn by four sphinxes diverse like the four sphinxes upon the door of the vault of the adepts, counterchanged in their component parts. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I, I want to actually skip to the Babylon part. So, okay. Um, Okay, so, um, sorry, my, my copy here goes on two different places. It says, the charioteer speaks in a low, solemn voice, awe-inspiring, like a very large and distant bell. Let him look upon the cup whose blood is mingled therein, for the wine of the cup is the blood of the saints. <coughs> 
Glory unto the scarlet woman, Babylon, the mother of abominations, that rideth upon the beast. For she hath spilt their blood in every corner of the earth, and lo, she hath mingled it in the cup of her whoredom. With the breath of her kisses hath she fermented it, and hath become the wine of the sacrament, the wine of the Sabbath. And in the holy assembly hath she poured it out for her worshippers, and they have become drunken thereon, so that face to face they have beheld my father. Thus they are made worthy to become partakers in the mystery of this holy vessel, for the blood is the life. So sitteth she from age to age, and the righteous are never weary of her kisses, and by her murders and fornications she, sedu she seduceth the world. That was hard to say. And he says, um, he has a little footnote, well, uh, a side note here. This wine is such that its virtue radiateth throughout the cup, and I reel under the intoxication of it. And every thought is destroyed by it. It abideth alone, and its name is compassion. I understand by compassion the sacrament of suffering, partaken of by the true worshippers of the highest. And it is an ecstasy in which there is no trace of pain. Its passivity, and he equals that to passion, is like the giving up of the self to the beloved. And let me just notice here as an aside too, Joseph Campbell once said that the highest type of love was the love of the prostitute, because the prostitute gives up everything, including reputation. Something worth thinking about. Okay, back to this. The voice continues. This is the mystery of Babylon, the mother of abominations. And this is the mystery of her adulteries, for she hath yielded up herself to everything that liveth and has become a partaker in its mystery. And because she hath made herself the servant of each, therefore she is the mistress of all. Not as yet canst thou comprehend her glory. Beautiful art thou, O Babylon, and desirable, for thou hast given thyself to everything that liveth, and thy weakness hath subdued their strength. For in that union thou didst understand. Therefore art thou called understanding, O Babylon, lady of the night. Okay, so we, we're seeing this association of Babylon with understanding, and this has a lot to do with the Sephirot of Bina, as we're going to say. But I also wanted to read from the cry of the ninth Aether, um, where, where they talk about the, the daughter of Babylon. This one is called Zip. Um, that is the name of the, uh, the governor of that Aether. And it refers to Leo, Sagittarius, Leo, um, Teth, Asamek, and Teth, number 78. Same number as Mesla, the influence from on high. The virgin Artemis in the midst of the house of the sun. Okay. And um, let's see if I can... Uh, okay, here we go. Um... <clears throat> says, Who is this that traveleth between the hosts and is poised upon the edge of the aether by the wings of Mot? Mot. Who is this that seeketh the house of the virgin? This is he hath given up his name. This is he whose blood has been gathered into the cup of Babylon. This is he that sitteth a little pile of dry dust in the city of pyramids. Okay. And so he um, he talks, they go through this, and they, they, there's other... Um, proclamations here and he says now then we are passed within the lines of the army and we are coming to a palace of which every stone is a separate jewel and set with millions of moons and this palace is nothing but the body of a woman proud and delicate beyond imagination fair she is like a child 12 years old she has very deep eyelids long lashes her eyes are closed or nearly closed it is impossible to say anything about her she is naked her whole body is covered with fine gold hairs that are the electric flames that are the spears of the mighty and terrible angels whose breastplates are the scales of her skin and the hair of her head that flows down to her feet is the very light of god himself of all the glories beheld by the seer in the aethers there is not one worthy to compare with her littlest fingernail for although he may not partake of the aether without the ceremonial preparations even the beholding of this aether from afar is like partaking in all the former aethers and the ring of the horizon above her is a company of glorious archangels with joined hands that stand and sing, This is the daughter of Babylon, the beautiful, that she hath borne unto the father of all, and unto all hath she <clears throat> borne her. This is the daughter of the king, this is the virgin of eternity. This is she that is the holy one, hath rested from giant time, and the prize of them that have overcome space. This is she that is set upon the throne of understanding. Holy, holy, holy is her name, not to be spoken among men. For Kore they have called her, and Malka, and Batula, and Persephone. Okay, so he goes on to talk about, about her. So th this is interesting because now we're seeing the archetype of the virgin archetype. Um, and of course we've talked about Persephone slash Kore um, in another podcast. But you definitely have this idea of um, the... Uh, um, you, you see this idea of Babylon, uh, you know, the daughter of Babylon as being virginal. Now, <clears throat> Babylon is, is shown as having two different partners. 
I mean, we see Babylon with the beast or with Therion, as we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, in the Gnostic mass, though, she is considered to be the, the partner of chaos. Uh, if you've attended the Gnostic Mass and you recite the Gnostic Creed, which, like in the Catholic Mass, where you recite the Nicene Creed, this is recited at the beginning, and of course the Creed begins, I believe in one secret ineffable Lord, and in one star in the company of stars, whose fire we are created, and to which we shall return, and in one Father of life, mystery of mystery, and his name Chaos, the sole vice region of the sun upon the earth, and in one air, the nourisher of all that breathes. And I believe in one earth, the mother of us all, and in one womb wherein all men are begotten, and wherein they shall rest, mystery of mystery, in her name Babylon. Okay, so in the Gnostic Mass, we see Babylon represented as this earth mother, and there's this virgin universe that is produced from chaos um, uh, out of this, uh, <clears throat> this, this is sort of this rebirth here. Um, of the universe, you know, there's this idea of this uh, this daughter of Babylon that's that's very important. Um, but you also have this idea of uh, of Babylon as sort of this, you know, she she's a, she's a whore, but she's also the mother um, of things. And, and pairing her up with chaos makes sense because obviously, the, you know, the relation, you know, the idea of love and sex as we tend to think of it in the more chaste sense. Um, is, is certainly con you know, considered part of the orderly traditional society, chaos being something outside of it. And the beast in, in its own way is, is a representation either of that chaos or of the sensuality uh, of the earth itself. And we all know that Crowley used the, the term beast again to re refer to himself and the Scarlet Women to refer to um, his, his partners, which uh, I will also talk about um, in a moment. Um, I just want to... Uh, I have a number of notes here, and I can't seem to, uh, <laughs> I'm bringing these up, and uh, some pieces of them seem to have disappeared, but, um, yeah, let's see. Oh, you know why I can't find it? Because I'm in the wrong place. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I was looking for. All right, so let me just, um, we move on from, uh, from this discussion. I want to go talk, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of Babylon as Bina, okay? Now, it, it, Bina is the, there's, uh, if you look, if you're familiar with the Kabbalah and familiar with the Ten Sephirot of the Tree of Life, um, it begins with Keter at the top and ends with Malkut. Keter being the crown and representing, it, it just, that, that is, which is just manifest and is below that, which is, um, you know, the Ein Sof, which is limitless light, you know, what's unmanifest. And then at the the bottom is Malkut, which represents, you know, in, in Jewish thinking, it's it's the Shekinah, it's the idea of the, um, it's the, the presence of the divine on the earth. And a feminine word is used for that, although, again, in Judaism, uh, Shekinah is, is not considered to be a deity of any kind. But the presence that resides in the Holy of Holy of the temples of, of the Jews is actually uh, is, uh, the Shekinah. So interesting that it has a feminine name, but they say, oh, oh no, the Shekinah is not feminine, but, but the word is certainly feminine. Okay. So, um, and, and there tends to be this idea of one being spiritual and one being material. But if we look at the tree of life, one of the things that is, that comes across is the idea is the tree of life is one. So there really isn't, um, a separation between the material and spiritual. Um, there's only, uh, an apparent one. So Bina is the third separate, um, and in part of what they call the supernal triad um, of uh, Keter, uh, Hokma, and Bina. And Hokma is generally a, a considered to be the Sephirot of wisdom and Bina of understanding. Okay, so there we have this idea of connecting Babylon with Bina, with understanding. Uh, Lyme Milo Duquette talks about this. I have his book, Magic of Thelema, and he says here, uh, to the student of Kabbalah, the easiest way to begin to understand Therion and Babylon is to conceptualize them as personifications of the second and third Sephirot on the Tree of Life, Hokma and Bina, respectively. The second Sephirot, Hokma, represents the original concept of duality, such as the, and as such the chaotic despoiler of perfect unity of the first Sephirot, Keter. Chaos is another title of Hokma, and a certain Thelemic ritual is identified with Therion. Okay, so there we see the connection between chaos and Therion. Hokma is also the divine will, the logos, the word whose vibration is the creative essence of the universe. As the supernal father, Hokma Therion is the archetype of the lingam, the universal male. As Tomega Therion, his motto is Magus, 
Crowley is considered by Thelemites to be the logos of the Aeon of Horus. The third Sephirah, Bina, represents the original reconciliation and balance of the divine self, Keter, and the reflected not-self, Hokma. She is viewed as the all-receptive mate of Hokma, and when they are united, the primal unity of Keter is realized. As Bina Babylon resides just above the abyss, she eventually receives unto herself the totality of the life of the evolving universe. This universal life is symbolized as the blood of the saints, which she gathers up into her cup, the Holy Grail. This she shares with the beast, and they unite in drunken ecstasy. Thus she is called the great whore for her quote-unquote shamelessness. She receives all and refuses none. Okay? As I mentioned, that is the ultimate type of love and compassion. Um, now, Lon Milo Duquette also goes on to talk about theory on Babylon as Shiva Shakti. To the student of yoga or tantric Buddhism, the easiest way to think about theory on and Babylon is conceptualize them as the two polar streams of creation. Shiva, the divine will, the Logos, who manifests in creative union with his divine consort Shakti, the divine power and underlying secret force permeating all of creation. Now, if you've gone through all, all of my uh, Mahavidya and Matrika um, discussions uh, in my previous podcasts, um, I'll, I'll refer you back to those if you haven't, to talk about what Shakti and the power of Shakti. Okay. Now, Babylon Shakti is the passive negative stream of nature. She is magnetic and attracts to herself the potentiality of energy. This she absorbs and stores up, the Holy Grail, the cup of Babylon. When the negative feminine Shakti comes into proper contact with the positive masculine Shiva, a dynamic reaction occurs, triggering the, tra triggering the transcendence of their, dynamic, uh, of their individual polarity, transforming them into Brahma, the changeless one. This is a most important... This is a most important aspect of Therion and Babylon because it relates to natural energies and forces residing in our own bodies. Slumbering in the form of a coiled serpent at the base of the human spine is the Kundalini, a remnant of the universal Shakti. She's been separated and exiled from her lord Shiva, who resides in the human skull, by the very process of creation. The task of Kundalini Yoga is to awaken the sleeping goddess and direct her ascent up the spine to eventual union with her lord in the cranium. But one does not have to be a yogi or Kabbalist or a ceremonial magician to achieve transcendental states of consciousness in the ecstasy of lovemaking or to temporarily annihilate the ego and orgasm. These are fundamental male-female realities of existence and consciousness, and they are an integral part of the cosmos from the lowest hell to the highest heaven. Okay. So that is the, uh, let me close my book here. That's the discussion of um, Babylon as, uh, as Bina. Okay, and this, you know, at least that's a very short explanation. There's, there's a lot more that could be said on that, but we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, I'd also, the last uh, card I, if, if you're watching this on YouTube that I had shown was of um, the, the lust card. And I wanted to read something about that from Crowley's uh, Book of Thoth. Um, <clears throat> Now he mentions, um, he, he, show, he talks about the card, the fact that she is uh, riding astride the beast. In her left hand, she holds the reins, representing the passion which unites them. In her right hand, she holds aloft the cup, the holy grail aflame with love and death. In this cup are mingled the elements of the sacrament of the Aeon. The Book of Lies devotes one chapter to the symbol. That's another Crowley work, if you're not familiar with it. And he, in this, um, he reads, uh, Waratah Blossom. Seven are the veils of the dancing girl in the harem of, of it. Seven are the names, and seven are the lamps beside her bed. Seven eunuchs guard her with drawn swords. No man may come nigh unto her. In her wine cup are seven streams of the blood of the seven spirits of God. Seven are the heads of the beast, whereon which she rideth. The head of an angel, the head of a saint, the head of a poet, the head of an adulterous woman, the head of a man of valor, the head of a satyr, and the head of a lion serpent. Seven letters hath her, hath her holiest name, and it is Babylon. This is the seal, and this is a seal. I'm going to show you a picture of the seal. Upon the ring, uh, if, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to show you a picture of the seal, but um, I will try to show you one um, in the icon for this as well, uh, if you're listening to this on uh, Spreaker or somewhere else. This is the seal upon the ring that is on the forefinger of it, and it is the seal upon the tombs of them whom she hath slain. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of our lady, and it is the number of a woman, and her number is 156. Okay. And in Enochian, this is because you have a table that uh, has 12 characters by 13, and you multiply that, you have 156. There's a reference to that, that central table there. Um, and he says, there is in this card a divine drunkenness or ecstasy. The woman is shown as more than a little drunk and more than a little mad. The lion is also aflame with lust. This signifies that the type of energy describes of the primitive creative order. It is completely independent of the criticism of reason. This card portrays the will of the aeon. In the background are the bloodless images of the saints. 
on whom this image travels, for their whole life has been absorbed into the Holy Grail. Now you shall know the chosen priest and apostle of infinite space is the prince priest of the beast. And in his woman called the Scarlet Woman, all power is given. They shall gather my children into their fold. They shall bring the glory of the stars into the hearts of men. For he is ever a sun and she a moon. But to him is the winged secret flame and to her the stooping starlight. This sacrament is the physical magical formula for attaining initiation for the accomplishment of the great work. And this is what you see in the Gnostic Mass, by the way. It is an alchemy in the process of distillation, op operated by internal ferment and the influence of the sun and the moon. Um, behind the figures of the beast and his bride are ten luminous rayed circles. They are the Sephiroth, latent and not yet in order, for every new aeon demands a new system of classification of the universe. At the top of the card is an emblem of the new light with ten horns of the beast, which are serpents sent forth in every direction to destroy and recreate the world. Okay, so that's Crowley on the idea of the card. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing to mention about the Tree of Life, there is a 11th Sephiroth, which is not usually, it's usually just shown as a blank, but sometimes shown as Doth or Dahat. And it is, that is known as the Abyss. So if, if the Tree of Life represents the, the journey, the spiritual journey of the initiate, if you will, if it's one way of conceptualizing it, um, this movement from Malkut, from the, the world that we know through these other energies, Dahat represents the crossing of the abyss. And the crossing of the abyss, um, in, in Thelemic thinking, um, you often are um, beset, and, and as Crowley is, and you see this also in the vision and the voice, by a demon called Karanazam. And, uh, you know, in its, and, and the idea is that the main, the main thing that this demon... <laughs> This, this demon this demon makes messiahs, as they say. Um, the, the Sephiroth of Tiferet, which is the sixth one, which is, is sort of in the center. I guess it is more or less in the center um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Kabbalistic uh, Tree of Life. And some, like Dion Fortune, have said that, that she doesn't think humans can rise above Tiferet. However, when one takes the Oath of the Abyss to cross to Hot, that's when they... It's almost like an initiation into um, the cult of Kali, as it were. It's like there's that crushing out. Uh, it's where you, you have to let go and you have to give up. Um, now, Peter Gray very interestingly mentions in his book on Babylon that, um, you know, Thelema seems to be very focused on will. Um, but at this point, you know, and Tantra is very much focused on letting go. So it's at this point when one really encounters Babylon, this is the point at which one really has to let go. Okay. And, you know, one has to be careful with what they may have learned along the way that they don't become a messiah or think of themselves as a new religious leader or as a new, um, you know, as somehow, you know, the possessor of some great revelation and therefore um, someone either to be worshipped or sanctified. There's, there's always that danger when crossing the abyss that you are going to, um, that if one has mastered something that they are going to believe that they are greater than what they are. And, um, you know, but Bina has to do with understanding and understanding has very little to do with evaluation. It has to do with what's perceived, what's intuited. Um, and, um, understanding does not come through analysis. Um, here's the, um, I, I'm showing on, if I'm again, on the YouTube version of this, I have the seal of Babylon, um, which is, uh, the, which, which contains another number 777 also associated with Babylon. Um, and this is a seal of, um, and it's a seven pointed star that you see that is associated, uh, with her. And I actually, um, have, have an image of myself, uh, with my, uh, Babylon ring that was made for me, um, in England. And it's, uh, um, you know, carrying that same actual seal. Um, but the, um, but that the seal contains is, is contains within, um, that, that mystery of Babylon, um, and the, um, the idea, you know, 666, the number of the beast, and then you have 777, you have the number of, of Babylon herself. Um, now, I was speaking of crossing the abyss, the last thing I want to talk about is something known as the Babylon working, okay? And this was performed by Jack Parsons and Marjorie Cameron. Um, now, Jack Parsons, if you've seen the TV show Stranger Things, you may be familiar with him. Jack Parsons is known for inventing rocket fuel. He is also known for being um, almost out, I don't know, uh, you might, some people might view him as out of his mind. And certainly he did take the oath of the abyss and, and whether, and I think he, you know, died trying to cross. But in any case, he and Cameron, in addition to many other things they tried to do, 
um, including something called the moon child working, um, which I think even Crowley was kind of like, what, what, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I mean, if you're too crazy for Crowley. Um, but, but rather than, than focus on that, what I want to focus on is this, um, this Babylon working that they, they did. And the result of this was something known as Lieber 49. Okay. And it was supposedly, um, uh, it's self-referenced as the book of Babylon it was written by Jack Parsons, uh, as a transmission from the goddess or a force called Babylon, um, received then. And he claims that this is the fourth chapter of the book of the law, which has three, and that this is a fourth. Now, official Thelema does not recognize this as a fourth chapter. However, um, nonetheless, it stands within. And I'll read to you a little bit of Lieber 49, because it's, it's 77 verses, as you might imagine, the, that, that number associated uh, with Babylon. And it starts, uh, Yea, it is I, Babylon. And this is my book. That is the fourth chapter of the Book of the Law. He completing the name, for I am out of Nuit by Horus, the incestuous sister of Rahor Quit. Okay, that's the way she uh, connects herself. It is Babylon. Time is, ye fools. Thou hast called me, O accursed and beloved fool. Now I now know that I, Babylon, would take flesh and come among men. I will come as a, a penniless flame, a devious song, a trumpet in judgment halls, a banner before armies. And I gather my children unto me, for the time is at hand. And this is the way of my incarnation. Heed. Thou shalt offer all, and thou hast at my al <clears throat> and thou hast all thou hast at my altar, withholding nothing. And thou shalt be smitten full sore, and thereafter thou shalt be outcast and accursed, a lonely wanderer in abominable places. Ye dare, I have asked for none other, nor have they asked. Else is vain, but thou hast willed it. Know then that thus I came to thee before, thou a great lord, and I a maid enwrapped. Ah, blind folly, and thereafter madness all in vain. Thus it has been, multiform, how thou hast burned beyond. I shall come again in the form thou knowest, now it shall be thy blood. The altar is a right and the robe, the perfume is sandal and the cloth green and gold. There is my cup, our book and the dagger. There is the flame, the sigil of devotion. Be it consecrated, be it true, be it daily affirmed, I am not scorned. Thy love is to me. Procure a disc of copper in diameter three inches. Paint upon there on a field blue the star of gold me, Babylon. It shall be my talisman. Consecrate with the supreme rituals of the word and the cup. My calls as thou knowest, all love songs are of me. Also seek me in the seventh there. Okay, the seventh aether. Okay, I'm not going to read any more of it, but you get the idea. So this is supposed to be um, the communication um, that they had with Babylon um, as the as the um, as this goddess um, or as this force, and um, you know, um, and Peter Gray's comment on it is that um, because Parsons uh, sends a letter to uh, Carl Germer, who had been was considered to be head of uh, the OTO Oro Templi Orientis, which was uh, the organization that Crowley didn't found, but that he took over from uh, Theodore Royce, um, and where Thelema now now pretty much has its official home in in the Ordo Temple Templi Orientis. Um, but he had, uh, you know, when when Crowley died, um, Carl Germer um, received a letter from Parsons. Um, and, and the indication was almost, you know, that he had, he was at the end of his life and the way, and the way Gray refers to it is, you know, here's a man who clearly took the oath of the abyss and, um, ended up being destroyed by it because the force of Babylon, it's one of the great mysteries because I think we tend to see creation as a good thing and destruction as a bad thing. Um, but I think the message here is that, um, destruction, uh, does not have to be. Destruction is sometimes necessary. You know, you have to, you know, if something's been built up and either it's false or it's taking over or it's, um, you know, it's something that, that, you know, no longer serves or, or that impedes, then you have to get rid of it. You have to get rid of it and replace it. Um, you, have to, you have to start over again. And starting over again repeatedly is, a, is definitely a theme of, of all the world's religions and mythologies. A mythology of the flood, you know. The Nephilim take over the earth. Well, this is the biblical version anyway. And then, you know, we got we to wipe everything out clean and start over again. There's, there's this idea, um, you know, uh, there, in, in Buddhism, there's the idea of, you know, first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there's a mountain again. And it's the idea of you build up, you gain all of this learning, you gain all of this knowledge, and eventually um, none of it serves you at all. 
uh, you're, you're, you're brought right back, you're brought low and right back to the beginning again. And you, you have to start again, um, new. Um, I think of the Odyssey, you know, with Odysseus, great warrior who's looted and gone everywhere and, 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 and you know, um, fought all these battles. He's a great king. And then what happens to him? He, you know, he, he upsets Poseidon. He ends up um, losing everything. He's clinging to a plank, you know, in the ocean. He spends some time with a nymph, but then when he's sent on his way again, Poseidon attacks him again, and then he's thrown out naked onto a shore where he has to, you know, be helped by a 12-year-old girl. I mean, this is this, this idea of being smashed to bits and starting over again. It's, it's definitely a theme, and it's a theme in our lives. And it's one that we're very much afraid of, which I think is part of the reason we're afraid of the energy of the dark feminine, because it creates us, but it also... It mushes us back into another form. And that destruction is something that we don't, um, we don't want to face. I mean, you know, for whatever, for whatever, wherever all the other esoteric symbolism and meaning we have of, of Bina, of understanding, of Babylon, and of the many layers. And of course, the fact that the Babylon written into the Bible is not necessarily what she appears to be you know it's not um you know we, we again we tend to think of her as a mother of abominations of an evil that has to be stamped out but that's good versus evil thinking and that's not really what she is for babylon to be laid low is actually um that's actually a problem because it's um and it is exactly what the church did um you know i talk about this in the dionysus episode as well you know this idea of removing removing that from from the earth, removing the um, the joy of life, the sensuality, that that drunken ecstasy that we see in tantra, that is taken out because you know it's bad, it's sinful. You know we we have to we must avoid it. We must chastise ourselves. We must stay away from it. Um, and so then we become something that we're not. Um, and but like the the beast that is on the the lust card, it's something. It's something to be um, contended with and experience, but also something to be kept in balance with everything else. Okay, it's not, it is a force. It's not a force to be suppressed. It's a force to be integrated. Um, so with that, I think I have said enough on Babylon. Probably there's a lot more I could say. I'm sure people will comment and tell me other things that I could be saying or that, oh, maybe you forgot this or that. But I like to think that I've covered all of the basics um, all, all the different basic attributes. Um, I'm sure that when I'm done recording, I'll, I'll think of something else I probably wanted to talk about. But I've recommended you to a couple of other sources. And, um, you know, and it's it's very, um, and, and for those who this might be much more esoteric podcast, if you're not as familiar, I apologize if I, if I haven't explained things particularly well. But it's, um, but, but there's, it, it, it's, it's a rabbit hole that you could go down, um, and you're welcome to do so if it, if it interests you. But that is, um, but I, I believe this is sort of a, a very superficial covering of, of the basics of this particular um, dark feminine figure and her influence certainly on Western esotericism. With that, I'd like to thank you again for listening. Please visit Cthonia.net, which has my podcasts and all of my other work. Um, so please visit. If you're interested in supporting my work, uh, please visit patreon.com slash Chthonia. There should be a lot more cool stuff coming up before the end of the year. So um, so please check it out. And if you want to follow me on social media, I'm just Chthonia on YouTube, and I'm Chthonia Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, two words on Facebook, one word on Instagram. That's it for me for now. Thank you so much to all my patrons and supporters, and I will talk to you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.